be careful that the devil's not hitting you with a plan B that may look right, that may seem to fit in, but that ultimately has nothing to do with God, but is 100% to do with the devil trying to take you off track. And here's something to remember. The devil's plan is always the easy road. God's road is the difficult road. It's normally a lot more painful, a lot more denial. It involves a lot more confrontation with darkness. I'm just telling you, please listen to me. Be careful of plan B. If you got your Bible this morning, would you turn to Matthew chapter 4? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1. This is just, we break into this story just as Jesus has been baptized. Um, and he's just had his baptism. The Holy Ghost has just came upon him. And this is what it says. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written. The devil likes to quote the word of God, by the way. The devil says, it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And said unto him, All these things will I give you, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. He's such a fool, isn't he? Mm -hmm. I mean, he's... Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. I've called this message this morning. It is time for an intelligence briefing, part four. Now, if you've missed part one, two, and three, um, do not fear. Um, first of all, we have copies of those messages, and you can get them off Elijah at the back. Um, but also, each message that we're covering stands alone. Um, as a unique individual message. Um, I'm sure you would all agree this morning that the church of Jesus Christ is in a constant ongoing battle with the enemy. Would you agree with that? It's a battle that never um, eases off. If you're a Christian in this house, you are involved in a daily battle. But an army that is not aware of the enemy's potential and plans is wide open to attack. Now, as crucial as it is to know who is for you, Scripture also instructs us to know who is against us. It's therefore necessary every so often for us to take time out to consider the character, the capabilities, and the aims of the devil. And this is crucial if you want to defeat your enemy. Information is golden, and it allows us to overcome the wicked one. There's so many people out there today in ignorance this morning. Many people throughout America are waking up this morning and they're totally ignorant to who's talking to them, who's controlling their life, to who is screaming in their ear day after day. Would you agree? They think that they're smart, but they're not. Now, whether it's an actual war where you're fighting for life and freedom, um, whether it's in sport where you're trying to defeat the opposition or whether it's in business when you're trying to beat the competition, knowing what you're up against is crucial. I'm telling you, it's crucial. 
Let me mention some of the greatest challenges with engaging the devil. And if you're writing notes this morning, you might want to write these three things down. This is the biggest challenge for us that we're that are fighting the devil. Number one, the hardest thing about spiritual warfare is that we are dealing with an invisible foe who speaks with a spiritual voice and not an audible voice. Basically, he operates in the dark or in secret. Would you agree that's a challenge? That's a major challenge. The next most difficult thing about spiritual warfare is that we fight an enemy who is not subject to any rules. He can say whatever he wants, and he can do whatever he wants. He's not accountable to anyone, and he's governed by no rules of engagement. Would you agree? He's not subject to any rules. We are. The final difficulty that we have with fighting the devil is that he has the advantage of surprise. He normally waits for a vulnerable moment and then he moves in for the kill. He knows your vulnerabilities. He knows your weaknesses. He knows the times in your life where you are more susceptible to be hit than others. Um, If you didn't get those three things down, I can email to them if anybody wants them there this morning. So all these three things are a good reason why we always need to be on our A-game. Uh, Let your guard drop and you're going to be hit by the enemy. Does Ecclesiastes 10 verse 8 not say, Whosoever breaketh a hedge, a serpent shall bite him. That's what the book says. If you've been here for parts 1, 2 and 3, then you should already be aware of who we are dealing with and what we're dealing with. In previous weeks, we have established the importance of knowing who your actual enemy is. We then have identified many of the evil aims that the devil has. This morning, I want to look again at how we can effectively counteract the devil and his schemes. How do we fight against him? What I am saying is, it's not enough to know your enemy. We need to know how to overcome him. So, how do we successfully respond to all the aims Schemes and lies of the devil. We've been working through um, different answers to this. Um, Number one. Last week we looked at um, number one to six, which is number one, get close to the Lord. Number two, be enlightened. Number three, put on the whole armor of God. Number four, protect your mind. Your mind is a target for the enemy. It's the devil's playing field. Number five, resist what has been thrown at you. Number six, remove the existing junk. So there's times you have to stop stuff getting in. But if stuff gets in, then you have to remove it, okay? Just in case you think we're looking at the same thing there. Number seven is what I want to look at this morning. Employ the word or the word of God to injure the devil. Number eight, Use the name of Jesus and highlight the blood of Jesus Christ. And number nine, which I, I, I didn't mention last week, um, let the power of the Holy Spirit enable you to overcome Satan. And whenever I cover that, I want to cover prayer. Okay, so that's the nine things. Uh, we've covered six, want to cover seven today and hopefully get to eight and nine next week. Now, I want to say this before I go any further. I recognize that there's an overlap in these nine things. Okay? They're all kind of overlapped um, because they're all interconnected. Okay? So if you see an overlap in these things, there's a reason for that. Um, So, number seven. We need to employ the word of God to hurt the devil. I woke up a few days ago with a phrase in my mind which I never use. It's not, it's not something that I use when I'm preaching. And it's not a phrase that I use in everyday language. And I couldn't shake that phrase off. And it, it was very strong the stage I knew it was the Lord. And the phrase was this, alternate reality. 
honestly, I didn't even really fully know what that was. Because I had to even go to Google because I'm like, alternate reality? Um, so I pon- I've been pondering on this alternate reality. And I, as I started to consider this, especially in the light of the subject that we're looking at, I came to the initial conclusion that reality is what God says. Would you agree? When it comes to spiritual matters, reality, facts, truth is what God says. That is because he knows, okay? The devil thinks he knows, but God knows. But anything that goes against God or what God states as a fact is alternate reality. That consequence, consequently brought me to a definite conclusion. Anything that the devil says to you is lies. Amen? That is why Jesus tells us in John 8, 44, that Satan is the father of lies and there is no truth in him. Honestly, if the devil's talking to you, don't believe him. That's basically it. Everything that will come out of his mouth is junk. Everything. When Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, he came with an alternate reality. That's what we're reading this morning. He come just trying to say, okay, this year's fact, whereas this year was fact. It's interesting how Jesus responded to the devil. It's very interesting how Jesus defeated the devil. He defeated the devil with it is written. It is so important for us to realize the offensive weapon that we possess to defeat the devil and expose his alternate reality is this book. Never underestimate this book. If someone else is in a battle and you want to lift them up, today we kind of send them a song to encourage them or we just send them a little a little uh, saying or cliche, you know, keep your chin up or whatever. I'm here to tell you, quote the word of God. Quote God's words. Because it's God's words that get into their spirit and lift them up ultimately. Amen? Amen. Ultimately, nobody can argue with this book. They can argue with you, but they can't argue with the book. If someone has an issue with the word, they have an issue with God. We're living in a day where people will say, well, I believe the Bible, but. And that but is actually telling you the part that they have an issue with, the part that God is exposing in their life. You cannot put a but upon it. All you can say is God's word is fully true. Remember man originally fell in the garden when Satan was able to convince Adam and Eve to work independent of the word of God. This was the alternate reality. Do you remember the lie? Did God really say that? Half God said. That's what the devil said in the Garden of Eden. Half God said. Did God really say that? And of course, it was from that lie that you and me today not only have been born in sin, but the fact is we're going to die because of that lie. Each person in this house, if Jesus doesn't come, is going to die. Because man swallowed a lie from the devil, did God say. If you are operating independent of the instruction of God's word, then you are operating independent of God. Let me say that once more. If you are operating independent of the instruction of God's word, then you are operating independent of God. Jesus did not just quote random scripture to the devil when he was attacked in the wilderness. He confronted each attack with suitable scripture that would expose his, the devil's schemes and strip him of his power. I'm here to tell you that you need to know this book because you need to employ applicable or necessary or appropriate scripture to expose what he's telling you. 
If you don't know this book, how are you going to fight him? By the way, this story in the scriptures actually happened. And examples like this are there for you and me to show us how do we counteract the devil. Now please don't underestimate the power of this book. Truth exposes lies. Light dispels darkness. Don't underestimate being under the word of God this morning. You could hear something this morning that could change your life for time and eternity. There's a reason why it is so hard to get Americans in the church in this day. Because the devil knows when you come through that door, there's a possibility that you could hear life today that could absolutely affect your eternity. That's why there's a war on. Brother, sister, there's a war on over the souls of men and women out there. One of the hardest things to do today is to get the unsaved, get the backslider under the preaching of God's word. Would you agree? Now, why do you think that is? Do you ever consider why is there such a fight? Why is there such a fight like never before to get people under the preaching of the word of God? Because the devil is scared of this book. See, sometimes we think the devil's scared of us. The devil is scared of this here in you. It's the truth of God in you that makes you a threat when you go into the workplace, when you go into the grocery store, whenever you go to a ball game. The devil is scared because there's truth within you and he's scared of you opening your mouth and sharing that truth. Mm -hmm. Today, whenever we go out there, we want to talk about everything else but God's truth. Mm -hmm. And we rarely even quote the word of God. Somebody comes up to us at a ball game and they've just been bereaved. We don't even know scripture verbatim to even encourage somebody going through that bereavement. We'll talk about the Huskers. We'll talk about politics. We'll talk about Trump and Biden. But we can't quote the word of God. I'm telling you, once you get onto this book and you start to quote scripture, you, you take the devil out of the game, first of all, but you also put something into that human being that could potentially change them forever. Do not underestimate the power of this book. It is so important that you grasp this this morning. If you want to destroy the devil in your life, you're going to have to apply what we're talking about. I want to say this. What God says is right. What God says goes. What God says works. And what God says will happen, will happen. Okay? Why would we not continually quote this book? When God speaks, then the devil is defeated. He's nothing to say. He can't, he, all he can do, he can run his mouth off, but he's defeated. Uh, Francis Francipan put it like this. There will be a battle after every breakthrough in God. That battle will be centered upon one main front. The word. Will we believe the word during the time of testing? Or will we fall back to our former state of unbelief and bondage? He continues. When a word from the Lord is spoken, expect that it will be contested by the devil. The battle will, without fail, be fought over what God has said. This battle will be won with a Christ-like character and holding fast to the word of God that has been spoken. End of quote. I'm telling you, where your victory comes today as a believer is walking by faith in response to what God has said. I think we have a misconception of faith today. Faith is just me being positive today. Faith is a response to what God says. Well, some of you, well, I've got faith. You talk, you talk to people out there. Everybody says they've got faith today. Seriously. People have faith, but it's not the faith that this book's talking about. I mean, you've got faith today even to sit on that chair that you're sitting on. 
Amen? How many of you checked out the screws in that chair to make sure it wasn't going to collapse this morning? How many of you did that? Michael Brown's got his hand up. (laughs) Oh no, he was scratching his head. Seriously, no, but would you agree that there, you, you need faith to get onto an airplane? Yeah. Would you agree? Yeah. Every time I get onto that airplane, this is all I can think is, I am putting such faith in those two pilots. Huh? I'm talking today about true faith. Faith is a response to what God says. God speaks and there's something within your heart that causes you to say, you know what, today's a good day. I'm a child of God. I'm beloved of the Lord. He says he's never going to leave me. He's never going to forsake me. Hallelujah. It's a good day. Amen. I was glad when they said unto me, Peter, yeah. I will come to the house of the Lord. Amen. I was glad. Preach. Do you understand? You're basing your lifestyle on truth. Amen. Well, I don't feel like coming to church this morning. Okay. There's a problem. What's the problem? There's something. You're listening to that devil who says, you don't need to go today. You don't need to read your Bible this morning. (coughs) Really? Where's that voice? Who's that voice? It's definitely a voice. Who's speaking to you? If you don't know this book, if you don't know this book, how can you recognize who's talking to you? Because there's a voice, but it's not an audible voice, but it's a voice that is going contrary to the voice of God. It's alternate reality. Now, saying all this, I want to say this. It's not enough to know the Word of God. We need to know how to apply it properly. After all, the devil is an expert at misrepresenting the book. That's what he does. So let's look at the first temptation. The devil opened his big mouth and says, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now think about this. Jesus had just went 40 days and 40 nights without food. And I don't know about you, like if I'm fasting, and, and honestly, it's not just the smell of food. Like Honestly, after 24 hours, even nuts start to be like, oh, what, what I would do just to have a handful of nuts. Seriously. If you're fasting, okay? But if people start to talk about food, it does your head in. And if you smell food, it's even worse. (laughs) After 40 days and 40 nights without food, the devil knew what he was doing. Amen? He says, and by the way, do you believe Jesus had the power to change them stones into into food? Huh? He could have had the most luxurious meal that had ever been created. He just had to speak the words. Mm -hmm. And that's what the devil was tempting him with. The devil knew exactly who Jesus was. Mm -hmm. He knew who he was dealing with. How did Jesus deal with this? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He quoted Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. By the way, Jesus doesn't miss the mark. He put the ball in the net here. He reminded the devil that we are not governed, we are not satisfied, and we are not nourished by the flesh. There's something more important than food. Amen? Natural food. And that is spiritual food. God's truth. I'm telling you today, they can deprive you of food. But I'm telling you, the worst deprivation that you can experience has been deprived of this book. So Christ basically demolished this attack by resisting the devil's lies and by employing applicable scripture to state the truth and expose his nonsense. This is what you need to do. This is what I need to do when we come under attack. You need to go to applicable scripture and not only read it, not just digest it, but become that and then share that truth. And sometimes, this tells me sometimes you have to talk to the devil. You know, I, I've heard people say, well, oh, I don't talk to the devil. 
And I know there is a time to ignore the devil, okay? Mm -hmm. But there is a time to speak to the devil and quote the word of God and ram it down his throat. Okay? The Holy Spirit will give you the wisdom when you ignore him and when you speak to him. Mm. I'm not talking about going looking for devils. I'm talking when he comes looking for you. Amen? Amen. We're, not, I, we're not just demon busters going looking for, for a fight for the devil. Honestly, there's people who see demons under every bed. That's all they want to talk about is the devil, the demons, their, their principalities and powers. Listen, we deal with him when he pops his head up. Okay? You know, I hear people, oh, we need to go and confront the demon powers of Omaha and all this. Says who? You watch, Jesus just dealt with the devil when he popped his head up along his road. Okay? If you're walking this path and God says, I want you to walk on this path, if the devil pops his head up, it's war. Okay? If the devil's over there and it's not for you to deal with, let some other believer deal with that. If he's over there, let some other believer deal with that. But I'm telling you, if he's standing on your path, he's resisting you, he's resisting your family, he's resisting this church, then you have authority to say no or go. Just get out of my way, you dirtbag. Go to hell. And I say, there's times, you, uh, all you need to say is go. Sometimes. There's other times you need to just arm yourself up with relevant scripture. Uh, sometimes you don't literally have a Bible there. Sometimes you can wake up in the night and you need to know the book. If you don't know this book, you're wide open to be attacked. Yep. Wide open to get hit. The second temptation, we'll find out in Matthew 4, 5. Uh, 6, sorry. The devil opens his big mouth again. He didn't take no for an answer. The devil's persistent, by the way. If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written. Oh, hmm. He's quoting the book. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. It's a bit of a change of tactic here. Here's the devil actually quoting the word of God. People who say the devil doesn't know the word and the devil doesn't quote the word don't understand reality. The devil can actually come to you and can point you in the direction of an alternate reality by quoting the book. Isn't that scary? So God could be wanting you to go north. The devil could get you going south by actually quoting the inspired word of God. Be careful what you receive and where you receive it. Having failed in his first attempt to get Jesus to fulfill the selfish desires of his flesh, Satan went to the other extreme and tempted Jesus to throw himself into the Father's protection. This was really sneaky. Simply, he was trying to tell Jesus what to do by manipulating the words of the Bible. By the way, he's really good at that. This is how Jesus responded to that attack. It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And he was quoting there Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. You see, if Jesus had submitted to one of these temptations, he could not have been the perfect sinless sacrifice at Calvary. Instead of responding to the voice of his father, he would have been responding to the voice of the devil. So even the devil can tell you to do something that's biblical or wholesome, but he can actually be taking you out of the will of God because it's not what God would want you to do. When God wants you to do it. So it's not enough to know what God wants you to do. You need to know when God wants you to do it. And by the way, the Lord will give you a piece about that. The Lord just dismisses this here tactic of the devil. 
I think sometimes we think we need to, when we're under attack, we need to get under this big, long, protracted battle with the devil. And, and we need to know 30 scriptures and we need to know them word for word. And if we don't, then we're, the devil can overcome us. I mean, how short is that statement? Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Huh? Go. 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 Christ again demolished this attack by resisting the devil's uh, lies and by employing applicable scripture to state the truth and expose this nonsense. What about the third temptation? We find out in verse 8, the devil took him to an exceeding high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and said unto them, All these things shall I give you if you will fall down and worship me. Wow. Wow. I can tell you the devil's full of himself. For him even to think that Jesus was going to actually get down on his knees and, and worship the devil, he's a fool. The devil is a fool. Mm -hmm. By the way, he's stupid. Anyone that thinks that he can be like the Most High whenever this earth was being created is a fool. Yeah. But to think that Jesus was going to bow down in front of him and worship him, I'm telling you, there's something wrong. Yeah. He's the one that is behind all the evil that's happening out there this morning. You think of the most horrendous things that are happening out there. The, I don't care, the, the, the genocide, the, the perversion, the, 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 the corruption in society and in government. Mm -hmm. Who is actually behind that? Who is planting the thoughts in there? It's this dirty, stinking devil. Mm -hmm. How does Jesus reply to this? By the way, just on this, he, Jesus knew that he was going to reach out to the nations. Please remember this. The devil, up until this point, was the god of the nations. The whole world was in darkness apart from Israel. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. There was one bitty nation and it was messed up when Jesus came. There was barely a flicker of light. When Jesus arrived, there was barely a light. The temple up the street was in apostasy. Mm -hmm. There was no entourage to receive the Messiah. There was two old timers. One of them was 108, called Anna. Anna and Simeon, that was the entourage that was waiting in the temple for Jesus. You can imagine them coming in with their walkers here. huh? It didn't look too impressive. Huh? But there in majesty and glory was the Son of God coming into the temple of God. But Jesus knew that he would get the nations. By the way, we're the fruit of it today. I, don't, I think most of us are of Gentile blood. Maybe you're a full Orthodox Jew in this place this morning. Um, that, that's good. That's fine. Not that it'll make any difference. It doesn't make you a better person. Huh? But I'm telling you that he, he, the gospel up until this was limited to the nation of Israel. After that, Christ was going to invade the nations. But here was an alternate route. He said, I'll give you all these nations now if you'll do one thing. Plan B. And I feel very exercised to share this. And if you're here to hear a word from heaven this morning, please listen to me. Be careful that the devil's not hitting you with a plan B that may look right, that may seem to fit in, but that ultimately has nothing to do with God, but is 100% to do with the devil, trying to take you off track. And here's something to remember. The devil's plan is always the easy road. God's road is the difficult road. It's normally normally a lot more painful, a lot more denial. It involves a lot more confrontation with darkness. Mm -hmm. I'm just telling you, please listen to me. Be careful of plan B. Mm -hmm. This was the devil's plan B. I'll give you what you want, and 
just be careful that what you want is what God wants. Think about it. Sila. Christ again demolished this attack by resisting the devil's lie and by employing applicable scripture to state the truth. This is what he said. It is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt you serve. I'm not going to worship you, you're going to worship me. By the way, there's a day coming where the devil is going to bow the knee. There's a day where every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every enemy of righteousness, every politician out there that thinks that they're smarter than God, all the laws that have been changing, one day they're going to acknowledge that He is Lord. Don't be troubled. We cannot change the human heart. Would you agree? Uh, I mean, we grieve over what God grieves at. We, agree, we grieve at the wave of iniquity that's coming in. We grieve at it. But I'm telling you, we don't, we don't let that discourage us. If you're discouraged this morning, there's something wrong. You're not standing on the Word of God. You don't realize how it's all going to pan out. You're just tied up with the here and now, with the moment. Sometimes we need to look beyond the other side of the mountain and realize it's going to be good. It's going to work out. Everything is going to work out. And all God's people said? Amen. This book is described in Scripture as an offensive weapon. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the Word of God is quick and powerful, or the Word of God is alive and active, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Do you realize this morning this book is actually shining into your heart this morning and is actually exposing what's in your heart? There's nothing else can do that. There's not another book like this in the world. There, there's nothing else that can get in exactly right into your heart and just put, it's just like a mirror. And as you look into this book, you're just looking at the reality. Reality, not alternate reality, reality. The only way you can actually recognize alternate reality is looking into the mirror and saying, here's reality. It's good to look in the mirror sometimes, amen? I know it's good on Facebook to put a photograph from 20 years ago and it's like, oh, you look so young and so beautiful and you had no wrinkles and there's no Botox and, <laughs> and there was no dyed hair or none of that stuff. But it's all a delusion. You're, that's not who you are today. Amen? And you see in this, but there should be a little state. This was me 20 years ago. This is not me now. <laughs> okay, but this book tells you exactly the truth. There's no, there's no delusion in it. Satan knows how real this book is. And he's been suffering the consequences of this book for centuries. By the way, do you see when governments take this book serious? Things change. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach for any people. Okay? So when the nation actually takes this book serious, there's a change in society. When a church takes this book serious, there's actually a change in that church. When a human being takes this book serious, there's a change in that human life. That's because Satan knows this is the voice of God. This book is a supernatural revelation of the heart and mind of God. It reveals the character and capability of God. It tells you what God hates and what God loves. It tells you exactly who you are. It tells you exactly who God is. It tells you exactly who the devil is. It tells us what God expects of human beings. This book introduces you to God it demonstrates how sinful human beings can encounter the living God and enjoy a healthy, intimate relationship with Him. It is a blueprint for your life. It holds the key to life and to every problem. It's your GPS to navigate around the hurdles of life. Um, it's also your signpost to heaven. This book points you to heaven. Amen? You actually can get the, 
your direction to get to heaven through this book. This book tells you how we overcome the devil. I'm here to tell you this morning that you can personally overcome this dirty, vile, stinking devil. You can. Look at what 1 John 2, 14 says. Ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Amen? Amen. Why are you strong? Because the word of God abides in you. If it's not in you, it'll not come out of you. That's why so many Christians are silent in the workplace today. They don't even know the book. So somebody, it's okay for the liberals to speak up and vomit a load of nonsense. It's cool for them. They can say whatever they want. But believers can't say, well, the Bible says or God says. That's wrong. There's something wrong today with America when it's okay to, to, to just vomit out the alternate reality, but you're not allowed to speak the reality. So for me, if someone is bold enough to speak out what the enemy is saying, I should be bold enough to say, no, I disagree. And sometimes you don't need to do it with like a confrontational attitude. Just dare to say, I don't agree and see what the reaction is. Yeah. <laughs> That's all you need to do. Just just say in a nice, gracious, godly, loving way, um, I don't agree with you. I don't agree with that. And immediately, yeah, you're a bigot, you're full of hate, you know, you're prejudiced, you're homophobic, you're blah, blah, blah. Seriously. So what? I don't care what you think. God says this and I'm aligning with God and that's it. I'm not going to apologize for him because he's always right. You see, if there was a little bit more boldness in the public square, I can tell you what, America would be a different country today. I don't care whether the president is saying that's right and all his government and all the Democrats and Republicans are going that way. If God says, no, that's the way and that's right, then they're wrong and he's right. Amen? Amen? And by the way, bit by bit, the politicians, one by one, are getting the stage where they're all going to be liberals. Okay? In the United Kingdom today, what is called conservative is liberal. And my concern is America is going the exact same way. Just watch it. Just watch it. Oh, it's happening quickly. And you say, what do you mean? Are you getting involved in politics? No, I'm getting involved with what God says. The politicians need to get in line with this. It's not about us getting in line with the politicians. No, they need to get in line with this book. So whenever they're taking a law here, we have the right to say, but God says this. Where, where do you stand in the light of this book? And even if you get outvoted, you should still be able to proclaim this book with boldness. Have you overcome the wicked one? Are you overcoming the wicked one? So, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, it shows us that we have one offensive weapon, and that's this book. It calls it the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And by using that sword, it says we are able to stand against the wiles or the schemes of the devil. So it's a sword that we use. It must be used offensively. By the way, we don't need any other weapon. I hear people say, is that, the only th- is that the only offensive weapon that we have as Christians? Yes. That's all we need. Brother, sister, that's the only weapon we need. There's something that I think sometimes we underestimate. Like there's no weapon that the American government can <coughs> ever create, or the Russian government, or the Chinese government, or any other government can create that is more potent than this book. Honestly, it it destroys kingdoms, this book. It exposes anything that is not right. So, as I come to a conclusion, it's not enough to know this book. We have to use this book. Would you agree? So here's the $64 million question. Are you? 
Are you using this book? Are you using this book personally? In life? In what you're going through at the moment? Are you using this book to counteract the lies that the devil has convinced you of? Are you using this book to banish what the enemy is saying? Are you just receiving all the junk? And then are you wondering, you know, I'm a Christian. I know, I know the book. I believe the book. And uh, I'm just so depressed. Just, I, I can't seem to get a victory. I can't even seem to get it. I have no fire in my Christian walk. And it's like, why? Why? Are you walking by faith? Or are you walking by fear and the junk that the enemy's hitting you with? Who is actually defining who you are? Is it the lie of the devil that's defining who you are? Or is it the truth of God that's defining who you are? Now, I want to go somewhere with that and, and as I come to an end. I want you to come close. When you feel condemned, remind yourself that Christ has justified you. Amen? Amen. If the devil has got you walking in condemnation, guilt, and shame this morning. You need to know what the book says, how Jesus Christ, by his precious blood, has justified you. Okay, I'm going to quote a few things. and I, I don't have time this morning to, to get into a lot of scripture with these, but you, you'll find out where I'm coming from. When the devil hurts you, Jesus can bring healing. When the devil produces hatred or bitterness in your heart, God brings love. When the devil creates unforgiveness, God brings forgiveness. When the devil brings carnality or sin into your life, God brings righteousness. When the devil makes it look hopeless, Christ gives you comfort and gives you hope. When the devil makes you feel defeated, Christ brings a wonderful victory. When the devil makes you ruthless, Christ makes you gracious. When the devil stirs up pride in your heart, the Holy Spirit brings humility. When the devil brings perversion, God brings purity. When the devil causes you to worry, God brings peace. When the devil discourages you, God encourages you. When the devil convinces you that you are rejected by God, Christ reminds you that he's with you to the end. I could go on and on and on and on and on. It's impossible for me to cover every single potential thing that the devil could hit you with. It's countless. But I'm telling you, for everything the devil can hit you with, the Lord's got an answer in this book. And it's not just to be aware of that reality. But you have to employ that reality to say, no devil, it is written. Then he hits you with something new. No, devil, it is written. Hit you again, but blah, blah, blah. No, it is written. That means that you are not walking in conformity to your own feelings, but you're walking in conformity to the facts, the truth, the reality. Is that your life this morning? Are you walking in truth? Are you walking in victory? Are you walking in the fact that it's all under control and it's all going to work out? Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Let us pray. We're looking at reality, the facts this morning. We're having an intelligence briefing. We're not ignoring the capabilities of the enemy. They're there. God in his infinite wisdom has allowed the devil to exist. But I can tell you the devil's only there because God believes that he can use the devil to actually bring something good out of us. Somewhere along the line, you get sick and tired and sick and tired of living for the devil because it always leaves you empty. Amen? Amen. When you're in the wrong path, it always leaves you empty. But when you're in God's path, there's just a peace. You could be going through the trial of your life at the moment and still have peace. I can tell you, you know where the victory is? Receiving the word of God into your heart this morning. That's where the victory is. It's, it's not just some magical words that we pray. It's just you recognize the truth, you receive the truth, and you become the truth. Just ask the Lord to cleanse you, forgive you this morning. Just ask him to 
take away all the junk, the lies, expose the, the, everything that is contrary to reality and just, just ask the Lord to clean you up this morning. We need a daily cleansing, amen? amen. Just God, forgive me. Cleanse me, Lord, of, of the propensity that I have to always go the wrong way, to listen to the wrong voice. There, there's something within us that the, the wrong voice always seems appealing. Would you agree? There's something about that devil. The devil appears as an angel of light. He, and he quotes the word of God sometimes just to back it up. Father, we thank you for the truth this morning. Lord, that we have something where we can gauge what is right and wrong. That we can determine with absolute sureness this morning that what can be trusted and what can't be trusted. Lord, we thank you for your truth. Thank you for enlightening us um, to what we're dealing with, who we're dealing with, and what the aims of that enemy really is. And I thank you that there's a place of victory for us. And Lord, we see this morning that that victory is found in walking in the truth of God, depending upon the truth of God, using the truth of God. I pray that we will employ this truth this week as we gain opportunity, as we're confronted with the darkness of this world, that we will actually let the Word of God rise up within us and quote the Word of God to this generation. Lord, there's so many Christians that are dumb. Lord, I, I don't say that figuratively. I'm talking about literally we, our mouths are dumb when it comes to speaking up, when it comes to carnality. We won't, we won't confront it. We won't defend righteousness. We just want to be dumb. Lord, I pray that you would just remove that dumb spirit from, from us, O oh God. Lord, that we would have a mouth that is full of boldness. Lord, we think of the early church who saw revival. They went everywhere preaching the word of God with boldness. Lord, give us that boldness, Lord, that we would, Lord, use this book to reach this generation. And Lord, even change our own lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand this morning.